Well, good morning, everybody. We are going to wrap up our study of 1 Peter today, so please turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. All good things must come to an end. And let's open with prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time you've given us to study your word this morning. May your Holy Spirit guide us in our study so that by your words we may be strengthened in our faith in your Son, Jesus, and grow in love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. So, let's take it from, well, we'll take it from verse 6. I want to say one more thing about uh, this wonderful verse about uh, casting all your cares on Him, um, which uh, which is our epistle reading this morning. How how, how appropriate! Well, one of the things a bit inappropriate. I, I don't know if if you eight o'clock folks if this hit you the way it did me, but we've got uh, this. Just happens to be the the third Sunday in Trinity, these were going to be the readings no matter what. But uh, you had the Micah reading, our sins will be cast in the depth of the sea. One of our hymns makes allusion to uh, sinking, and so kind of an unfortunate coincidence with what was on everybody's mind this week with that, that submersible uh, that, 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 that exploded, I guess. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, uh, beginning in verse 6, the, the, the epistle reading is, is this section of, of 1 Peter chapter 5. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. We'll get to the final readings in just a second. But you remember last week I said that no English translation can do this verse 7 justice that cast, cast all your cares on him, or casting all your cares on him, because he cares for you, and that because he cares for you um, uh, clause, it, it's, it's worded in such a way that the point is that this is God's job. Caring for you belongs to him, is the way this is worded. Care of you belongs to him. In other words, it's not your job to be anxious, it's God's job. Moreover, in Greek, this is a, a, a special thing, in Greek, an, an imperative verb, you know what I mean by an imperative, a command. When, when, you, when, you, put, when you use a verb and you're using it to mean, to, to tell someone to do something, that, that those imperatives can, can be in one of two tenses. Um, what, what one tense is sort of uh, what, we, what we would call the past tense, and another, uh, the other tense that, that imperatives can, can appear in is the present tense. Well, in Greek, this signif the, there's a big difference. If, if a command word is put in the past tense, it's still a command, but it's a, it, it, it's a one-time thing. Do this. Versus present tense command it's a, continually thing, a continual thing to do. This is the past tense verb, which means he's saying, cast your cares on him and be done with it. That, that, that's the force of it. They're on his shoulders now. You move on. That, that, that's all there in the Greeks. You see what I mean? The English just cannot do this word justice, this, uh, this verse justice. Uh, incidentally, that uh, if you turn in your, your Bibles to the end of John, Big John, not, not, one, not one of those little Johns toward the back, but Big John, and this is um, end of verse, this is chapter 20, and end of verse 31. 
And uh, th this is a, a kind of a similar issue where the tense makes a difference. So that to this day, there, there's an argument because you have a flag on the play. We talked about this in the John class just this past Wednesday. Remember when Will brought up the, the business of the, the last verses of Mark that, that, that are in our Bibles are probably not original, or pro were probably not written by Mark. We have better manuscripts now than when the, uh, the King James was put together, and, uh, and, and, and so it, it's very unlikely that verses 9 through 20 were part of the original version of the Gospel of Mark. And we, we said how there are only two passages like that in all of the New Testament. Uh, that one and the woman caught in adultery story in John chapter 8. Uh, otherwise, all these variations in the different copies of the originals that we have really make no difference. You know, they're, they're, they're little things like uh, what one, one manuscript has the word the and another manuscript doesn't. Th those kinds of things. Or, and, and they certainly don't affect doctrinal matters. So as we said, if, if a certain verse in 1 John wasn't original to 1 John, and there's, 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 a, a good, there's this reason to believe that, that a particular verse in 1 John that, that we've grown up thinking is part of 1 John may not have been. Even without that, it's not like that's the only verse you need. It, it's a verse that supports the Trinity. But it's not like that's the only verse... That, that supports the doctrine of the Trinity. You have other verses in the New Testament that also uh, support the Trinity. Uh, so n none of these, these variations among the manuscripts affect any of the important doctrines of, of the Christian faith. Now, now here's one that's kind of interesting that again doesn't really affect a doctrine, but it, it does affect how you might read the book of John. Notice what it says. It says these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, there are different manuscripts. Does, does our footnote say, do you have a footnote on that at all? Uh, footnote, let's see, it's superscript, it's for the word believe. Superscript A. Da, 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 da. Do we have any... Anybody got a footnote to that? It says, may continue to believe. Oh, excellent. Okay, D does mine have that? Do you have the Lutheran stuff? No, no, you, you, yeah, you've got the NIV. Okay, do you hear what Greg said? His says, may continue to believe. There are different manuscripts. There's one letter difference. One letter difference. But that one letter changes the tense. And depending on the tense, John is either saying, so that you might believe, you who don't yet, or that you may continue to believe those who already are. You follow me? So, again, is, is that the end of the world, whether, whether the letter is a, is a short E or a long E, basically? No, but it does make you, it makes you think. Okay, to what audience does John? What audience does John have in mind when he writes this book? Is is this for the sake of converting unbelievers to the faith, or is this a, a, a word that's that's encouraging to those who already believe that they might be strengthened in the faith that they already have? And 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 so it can go either way, and and. The, the manuscript traditions probably favor the latter. The better manuscripts, the older ones favor. But anyway, just, just to give you an example of how tense matters, right? Uh, tense matters here. No variance on this one. Cast your cares on him. It's a past tense command, which means give him your worries and be done with it. Now they're his and no longer yours. Because that's his job, to worry about you. Um, let's see. Anything new there? Oh, uh, just, uh, uh that, that devil prowls around like a roaring lion. Uh, it was because of this verse that when I first started here, I objected to our school's newsletter. See, we are the wildcats. 
Okay? And our school's monthly, uh, weekly newsletter was called Prowling About. <laughs> so what are we saying about the children here? Uh, little, those little devils? Uh, so, so now it's the weekly war. It's the weekly war. So that, that's a little better. Problem solved. Uh, problem solved, <laughs> except he's also a roaring lion. So I do not... Uh, so. <laughs> uh, besides, what is a wild cat? Oh, I, I guess, I guess it, it's any number of... Uh, it can be a woman, too. <laughs> yeah, that's, right. that's right. See, I grew up, uh, my, my school's mascot, they were the blue cats. What's a blue cat? <laughs> is, is, that a, is that a natural color for a cat? Um, okay, final greetings. So here is, um, uh, just, just like in our letters, right? We, we might say, uh, say hi to so-and-so for me, that kind of thing. And typically in a Greco-Roman letter, uh, you, you end with, with a word like this, you, you issue final greetings. There, there aren't too many of them here as there are in many of Paul's letters. You think of uh, Romans especially. He's got all kinds of people that are with him that are saying hi, and then there are all kinds of people at Rome that he wants to say hi to. Uh, this, is, um, th 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 this is not uh, as belabored as that, but... It, it tells us a lot about the, the the circumstances in which Peter wrote this letter, where he is, and helps gives us an idea, helps give us an idea as to when he, he might have written this. So first of all, by Sylvanus, my grandparents had a Sylvanian television. <laughs> by Sylvanus, after whom the television sets were named, a faithful brother as I regard him. I've written briefly to you exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Okay. Um, so who's this Sylvanus? Okay, uh, he's telling us that, uh, that, that this Sylvanus is, uh, plays a big part in the writing of this letter and, and also its circulation. But, but we know something about this guy from elsewhere in the New Testament. Does he travel with Peter? Not, we don't see him traveling with Peter from, from what we know about him from other parts of the New Testament. We see him traveling with another apostle. Paul. Paul. Does that ring any bells? Who is this Sylvanus? Silas. Silas. So Sylvanus is, is just a longer form of his name. Silas is probably his given name, uh, and, and Sylvanus is the Greek form of it. It's the Greek form uh, of his name. So who is this Silas? What do you remember about Silas? Okay. Jailer? Silas wasn't the jailer. Silas was prison. But what about a jailer? He was in prison with Paul. He was in prison with Paul. Anybody remember where? <laughs> Philippi. And the Philippian jailer who was going to take his own life uh, when the earthquake opened the doors to the prison cell. And, uh, but Paul and Silas, uh, they, they were uh, spreading the gospel together. So Silas, we know, was, was a companion of Paul for... Uh, much of his third missionary journey, and now we see him at Peter's side, and uh, likely the one who took, say, Peter's dictation. Peter dictates the letter to Silas or to Sylvanus, and Sylvanus may have polished it up. That, 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 that's a theory. That, uh, and we talked about this, that... Uh, Peter, we know, was what? By, by trade. He was a fisherman. And, and so we also know of that scene, I think it's in Acts 5, where he and John are before the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin, the council, the same council that condemned Jesus, 
they're, they're putting John, Peter and John on trial here, and Peter and John defend themselves and say, we must obey God rather than men. What, what are they amazed by in terms of Peter and John's speech to them? Okay. They're like educated. Yes. They were like educated. See, they, they were impressed by their seeming learning. But these are simple fishermen, is kind of the idea. However, to, to kind of counter that, what, what, what the Sanhedrin are probably saying is not that they're dumb. It, it's, it's not that they're not capable of putting words together. They're, they're not hayseeds or rednecks or hicks. They're not saying that so much as they're not seminary trained. That, that, that's that's the, the, the charge that these people know the Bible, know the scriptures the way we do, who actually went to school for a long time to learn. That, that's but, but it, it doesn't mean that you couldn't expect Peter to write or speak well. <coughs> because let's remember, when we say they're fishermen, uh, they're, they're, it's not, uh, and, and this isn't fair to them too, because you know, they're, they're very bright. But, but what, what was the, what's the reality show that, that, that was so popular? The, 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 duck, the Duck Dynasty guys, oh, right? Yeah. Okay, it's not, but, but think, Think of them, right? You think, oh, they're, they're a bunch of, you know, hunters and, and, and so forth. Okay, but they're also very savvy. That They have run a very successful business. And so has Peter, James, and John. Uh, Luke uses the word to describe their employees as business partners. Okay, these guys are bright. And to be successful at business in the world in which they're living, means they've got to be fluent in several languages. Because they're conducting business probably in Greek. They're, they're writing up contracts in Greek. And they're, they're probably, they're, they're hearing Hebrew uh, at the synagogue, they're, they're speaking Aramaic at home or among themselves. But th there's no reason to believe Peter himself is not capable of writing this letter. That being said, many have suggested because the, the, the letter of 1 Peter is very good Greek. Erasmus, the great humanist, the you know, greatest man of letters of his century, is very impressed by 1 Peter and, and says, Peter uh, uh, writes uh, sparsely, uh, his letter is sparsely written but crammed with content. And, and I use that as an excuse for taking... 25 weeks to, to, cover, <laughs> to, to cover five chapters. See, Erasmus himself said it should, it should take a while to get through this. <laughs> um, but but uh, again, this, the kind of the conventional uh, speculation is that, 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 that Peter dictates to Silas and Silas who very likely is a, a more polished writer, makes it the beautiful prose that it is. Um, so, for, for, for what it's worth. And, and we do know that that, that was a, a common thing. Yeah, it remained a common thing for, for, for centuries. That, that you, you would you know, take, say, a, a, an important letter that you needed to write to someone higher than you in station. And there were professional letter writers that, that you would go to and say, okay, I, I need my letter to say this. You know, they were kind of ghost writers, but, but for letters. And, and so who's to say Silas didn't play that role uh, in, in, in the case of First Peter? All right. So he, he tells us exactly uh, what, what his letter is about. And this reinforces the approach we've taken, which is to see over and over again Peter starting with the grace of God, starting with the gospel, and then moving to what the implications of the gospel have for how we're to live our lives. And so it's kind of the, the, the Lutheran order of a sermon reversed. Gospel then law, gospel then law, gospel then law. Um, 
We're gospel therefore law. Gospel therefore law. This, this is who we are in Christ. This is what God has done for us. This is the future we have waiting for us. Therefore live this way. Therefore live in a way consistent with, with the truth which is the gospel I just proclaimed. And, and so what does he say here? I've written briefly to you exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. So if we miss that, if we see only law in 1 Peter, Peter himself says, you've misread my letter. Because the letter is all about declaring to you the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Now then, she who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. So what's that about? She who is at Babylon. Who is the she? Is it the church in Rome? Yeah, so before we get to, to where what Babylon's a reference to, let's at least get the she. The she is probably almost uh, definitely a church, the church. Why is it feminine? Why is she? Because the word for church is a feminine word, ecclesia. So she who is at the, the, the church, and, and, and besides that, the biblical image of the church being Christ's bride. Christ is the bridegroom and, and the church which, which he redeem, redeems and, and saves and adorns uh, uh, with, 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 with all his gifts is, is the bride. Now, and, and, and see also who is likewise chosen. So we're, we're right back to the beginning. Go back to 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. See, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect, chosen, exiles of the dispersion, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. So, who, who are the chosen ones at the beginning of the letter? Who's he addressing? Churches. Nation. Churches. Churches in Asia Minor. These churches in Pontus and Galatia and Bithynia, Cappadocia. So that all reinforces the idea that, that the she here is the church wherever Peter is at this point. And, and where that is, is Babylon. Now, what could Babylon refer to? I mean, that, that there's, you've got basically two choices here. Is Babylon one of the answers? Babylon could be one of the answers. <laughs> Babylon is Babylon. <laughs> See, don't don't uh, don't give up on the obvious, right? It, Babylon could be Babylon. In which case, he's writing from where? That would be present day what? Iraq. Iraq. Yeah, maybe, maybe. A couple of problems with that theory, but uh, and then 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 what? Well, what? What would the other theory be behind what Babylon is a reference to? Rome. Yeah. Rome. Why Rome? Present day Babylon. Yes, yeah. the present day Babylon. In what way? <laughs> so so what? What does Babylon stand for? What is what does that image take us back to? Okay, ne ne Nebuchadnezzar. And what about Nebuchadnezzar? Well, they had false gods. False gods. It, it was there that, that God's people were, were taken into to exile. Uh, Babylon stood for, well, Babylon, even after the Israelites were allowed to return to Jerusalem, and even after the Babylonian Empire itself was overthrown, continued to stand for the, the, the world at enmity with God. A world filled with wickedness. And that's certainly how John's going to use the Babylon image in the Revelation. The Revelation, at the very last book of the, of the Bible. Uh, Babylon isn't literally Babylon, literally present-day Iraq. In the, the, again, the problem with Babylon being Babylon for Peter is that no one's calling it Babylon anymore at the time he writes this letter. Hadn't been called Babylon in a long time. So what does Babylon conjure up in the minds of those he's addressed already using all these Old Testament images? 
And, and, and we've, we've focused on these as, as we got to them over the course of the last many weeks, that they're the uh, elect exiles of the dispersion, the diaspora, he, the, the, they're scattered, just as, as God's people have been scattered uh, ever since, even, even before the, the Babylonian conquest, the Assyrian conquest. Scattered. Uh, but, but, but now, Peter's appropriating that image of being scattered, not in the sense of no longer being in Jerusalem, but not being where. How are we in exile? Not in heaven. We're not in heaven. See, our true home is heaven, is, is with God. And so until we're there, we are scattered. We are dispersed in a full, among, a, among a foreign people, in foreign land. Much as the Jews literally were scattered in among a foreign people uh, through a much of their history. So he, he, he's used that image. He's used, um, he, he's, he's taken words that were spoken to the Israelites coming out of, the, out of Egypt, where, where, where God calls them this. God calls them a, a, a holy a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Uh, before that, we have them being referred to as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. So all these, these terms, these labels that were Old Testament Israel words. Peter is saying, these belong just as much to you now, you who believe in Christ, whether you're a Jew or not. And so here he is at the very end of his letter doing a similar thing and appropriating an Old Testament image. He's not literally in Babylon, but he's in what is Babylon for them today, the capital city of a, an empire at odds with God's kingdom. So, so the, I, I think the you know the, the, the best view, the, the more likely view, is to take Babylon as a reference to Rome, um, uh, n not not literally Babylon. Th though you will find scholars that I, I think just to be contrary, you know, try to, to try, try to put up an argument that no, no, he really means Babylon. Um, I suppose. Uh, I, I, I haven't found this to be the case in, in uh, I guess I, I, I know of at least one scholar that, that really strives to have Babylon not be Rome. But, but you get the sense that he's doing it, uh, this, this particular scholar, because he really wants to uh, let, let the Roman Catholics have it. Uh, in, in the sense that See, without this, without this, you, you really have no New Testament evidence that Peter was ever in Rome. And, and so wouldn't it be nice to take even this away? That, that kind of thing. And no, no, it, 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 he was in Rome. And, and, and there's no really good reason to doubt the very early reports that, that Peter was martyred there. Yeah, it's a very early tradition that the report that Peter was crucified upside down in Rome. Uh, you know, this isn't, you know, centuries after the fact to sort of create this backstory that supports the claim that whoever's head of Rome is the head of the church, that kind of thing. No, no, P Peter, Peter did likely end his, his missionary career in Rome. And, and that also helps us date this thing in that... It was late. It had to have been late in his life that he's there. And, and why do we say that? Well, because if you follow the chronology in Acts, um, he falls out of the story pretty much in Acts 15. The, and and what's, what's significant about Acts 15? What big event happens in Acts 15? <clears throat> no, no, that's earlier. The council at Jerusalem. So, so that, that's the big meeting where they fight about what to do with the Gentile converts. How much of the Old Testament law should the Gentiles be expected to follow? And Peter and Paul are on the same side in that one. 
But, but what, what's worth pointing out is, who's heading the meeting? James. 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 Not Peter, not the first pope apparently. <laughs> like someone said, if, if Peter was the first pope, someone should have told him. <laughs> uh, so, so James is the one that makes the final decision. Peter and Paul are just among the other debaters in the, in, in, in the, the council. So, so in, in Acts, Peter falls out. Peter goes, go, goes on the mission trail. He's not staying at headquarters in Jerusalem. He leaves that to James. Uh, but it must be sometime later that he ends up at Rome because when Paul writes his letter to the Romans, and remember I mentioned, you know, if you go back to Romans and, and read... Uh, uh, six, chapter 16, last chapter of Romans, you've got all those people Paul says hi to. If Peter's there, don't you think he'd say hi? <laughs> Peter ain't in that list. So he's not in Rome then, when, when, when Peter writes his letter to the Romans, which is probably late 50s. 50s, not 1950s, 50s. Um, <laughs> So, sometime, let's say, after 58, but then as an end date, either, I mean, the most possible last year that, that you could date Peter's death would be 68. But it could have been, you'll, you'll read some chronologies that suggest it was as early as 64. And, and, and why, why, why those, those dates? Well, we know it happened under Nero, we know Nero's reign was 54 to 68. We know his persecution of Christians really didn't start in earnest until 64. And so somewhere in that range is the last possible year Peter could have been in Rome and, and, and be able to write this letter before his death. So, so there's, um, th there's that. And then... Um, Sends you greetings. So, so the church at Rome sends these churches in Asia Minor greetings. And so does Mark, my son. Who's this Mark? Gospel of Mark writer. Gospel of Mark writer. Yes. And what do we know about this Mark? You should know some things about Mark. Not a disciple? Not, a, not one of the apostles, that's correct. He traveled with Paul until he didn't. <laughs> Remember this? There was a falling out between Paul and Mark. So on one of the missionary journeys, Mark apparently left the group uh, about the time they moved into the area where the Galatian churches were. And on the next missionary journey, Barnabas and Paul were going to go together. And, they wanted, and Barnabas wanted to take Mark with them. Paul held it against Mark that he bailed out the last trip. And so that's when you get Paul going with, with uh, Silas. And he's going to pick up Timothy. Uh, Luke as well, when they get to, um, uh, to Macedonia. So... Um, uh, that's a little bit about Mark. It's Mark's, apparently, mother who has a big enough house to keep the disciples. So it's, it's at Mark's mom's house, is it not? Where when Peter is released from the prison, remember this? And he, and he knocks on the door, and, and the, 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 the girl Sorry, answers the door and, and can't believe it's Peter, but then doesn't open the door for him. Yeah, yeah. She, she she runs back and tells everybody Peter's at the door. Well, why don't you let him in? <laughs> uh, but that that that's Mark's mom's house. Yeah, uh, we we know too that in one of the later letters of Paul that he and Mark are reconciled. Paul has a good word to say about about Mark. But here's Mark with Peter. And very early tradition, we, we talked about this when we read the book of Mark together, very early tradition has it that Mark 
in writing his gospel was essentially collecting what, what Peter had said in his sermons and, and putting it in a narrative form. So, so though Mark was not an apostle, though Luke was not an apostle, in a sense, each of the, their gospels are Peter's and Paul's respectively. <clears throat> Luke's books, Gospel of Luke, Acts of the Apostles received Paul's blessing and approval, and Mark's gospel would have received Peter's blessing and approval. But he calls him my son. What about that? Well, we've got two options. What could my son be a reference to? Maybe son means Mark's his son. Or... Affectionate way, he's like a son. He's yeah. Been with, like I have several daughters biologically, they are not my daughters. Right, right. One of them is black, and people look at her real funny. Right. This is my daughter. Yeah. So uh, there, there's there's no there, there's there's nothing to support the idea that Mark was was Peter's biological son, yeah. it, 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 except this. You know, that, that, that's, that's, that there's, there's no other count, and, and you would think that if Mark, if, if Mark was Peter's biological son, or, or that, let's say, the, the, the Mark he's referring to is not the Mark we've been talking about up to this point, but some other Mark, that that would be known to us in, in extra-biblical writings. That that'd be a big deal to, to be the son of, of one of the apostles. And, and we, there's just no record whatsoever of, of a Mark who was Peter's biological son. So it stands to reason that he's referring to Mark in an affectionate way. It's a term of endearment. But, it, but it's also, it, it makes a theological point that, remember when we're talking about the address to the, the elders and the youngers, and what do we say the youngers was a reference to? The youngers are who? Are who? who are the youngers? The congregation. The congregation. Right? The, 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 the people that receive the word from the elders, from the, the, the priest, the bishop, the, the overseer, the shepherd, the pastor. That, that Peter is that to Mark. P Peter is as a, an elder to Mark. And, and, and now it's, we, we're, we're moved from shepherd to sheep image or... Uh, older, younger image, now father, son. Paul will do the same thing with Timothy. T Timothy is to him a son. Not biologically, but a son in the faith. Okay? And now, greet one another with the kiss of love. Sh should we bring that custom back? <laughs> no? We're just looking Any for sharing of the peace. Yeah, we just want to share the peace. Uh, shake of the hand. Bring it back. Bring back the kiss of love, huh? The grapes used to be each other with his shoulder, pat on his shoulder, or a kiss on the side. Right. See, it, it, it would not necessarily be um, unlikely or implausible that they were kissing each other on the lips. I mean, in Europe and some here, Italy, don't they still? Men. Men will kiss and women will kiss each other on the, you know, as, 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 a, as a friendship thing. Uh, so that, that was the custom then. Um, it's interesting, in, in, uh, we have the letter of, uh, of Pliny to Trajan asking basically what to do with these Christians. And, and these are the things he's observed, or spies of his have observed uh, among their, their worship services. One was the charge of cannibalism, because they're eating the body and blood of, of, of Christ. Another was incest, because they're calling each other brother and sister, and they're kissing. See? So, uh, so if we bring it back, just know that, that we might be accused of that. Uh, and peace to all of you who are in Christ. And so there he, he uh, ends his, uh, his uh, letter. Uh, and I've given you a summary of, uh, of the letter.
kind of a bird's eye view of all that we've gone over. Because it's nice also to see the letter as a whole. We've done a deep dive, verse by verse, but it's nice to, to pull up and, and, and see the whole thing and, and how it coheres. So uh, I've already talked about when Peter would have written this, where he would have written it from. What's his overall purpose? Over and over again, we have this theme of, of, of being patient, being courageous, standing firm in the face of persecution. Uh, uh, Christ is, is uh, uh, shown as an example, the pattern, the, uh, the, the, the outline that you trace, that you copy in uh, kind of uh, taking the abuse that the world heaps on you and, and, and bearing it uh, uh, gently, not, not seeking revenge, leaving revenge uh, to, to God and, and staying in your lane, as it were, in various ways as citizens, as spouses, as employees and employers and so forth. Um, but but so, some of the, the themes in general. Hope, obviously. And, and that word hope comes up quite a bit. Courage, grace, baptism, we said. In a very early reading of, of First Peter, it goes way back to read baptism as... Uh, I, mean, I mean, to read the, the, the letter of First Peter as part of a, what was maybe used as an Eastertide address... Uh, that um, uh, when, when converts were, were, were taken through a very rigorous, long process of, of instruction in the faith and then were, were baptized and admitted to the Lord's Supper, that, that perhaps this was read to them as an address speaking to the newly baptized as what the baptized life looks like. And, and so we have that very explicit reference to baptism in chapter 3, but we have allusions to it in, in, in other places, one of which is right off the bat, um, uh, verse 3, the one verse 3, according to his great mercy has caused us to be uh, born again, born again to a living hope. And uh, uh, born again how? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And when he talks about baptism in chapter 3, what is it that gives baptism its power? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in verse 3, verse 21, baptism, which corresponds to the flood, and the flood which saved Noah and his family, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we've got born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, baptized through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, put them together. Born again is yet another way of talking about being baptized. You're born again when you're baptized. Jesus uses baptism uh, as, uh, uses born of being born again, rebirth, as an image for baptism in his conversation with Nicodemus. You cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you are born again. Born of water and the spirit. Born of water and the spirit. Uh, and what's the next thing we see Peter, uh, Jesus and the disciples doing after he finishes with Nicodemus? They're baptizing Peter. Um, okay, uh, pilgrimage, this whole idea that we're, we're not where we belong. This is only temporary. We're, we're sojourners on this earth. Our true home is with God in heaven. And, and, and so always to be mindful of, of that position, not to become so comfortable with our place of exile that, that we forget where our citizenship actually lies. Uh, suffering, of course. And, and, and let's say a little, little word about that. Um, I mentioned earlier that the, the, the Neronian persecutions really don't get started till 64, 64 uh, to 68. There's, there's hardly a hint in First Peter of some kind of empire-wide government-run persecution of Christians. And, and, and we know we, we, we don't have a Colosseum finished yet. We, we, we don't have Christians being thrown to the lions yet. That's not what Peter means by suffering in this letter. But what does he mean? What kind of suffering are the Christians he's addressing experiencing at this time? Not participating in the cultures they live in. Yeah, so we've got a lot of things in the world's way of living 
that the Christians are, because of their faith, abstaining from. And so how do you think that's playing out among their worldly neighbors? They're being derided, mocked, scorned, ostracized. That's the form that this persecution is probably taking at the point at which Peter writes this letter. We can relate to that, can't we? Um, that, that's the suffering that uh, Peter is, is strengthening them in the face of. And what does he even say at one point? When you suffer, you shouldn't be this. Instead, you should do this. Yeah. Instead of being surprised, rejoice. Where where does the, the prospect of surprise come in? Why would he be why would he put it that way? Why might they be surprised that they're suffering? They're, they're doing what God wants, so shouldn't they be blessed? Yeah, see, they're they're being faithful. They're doing what, what God has told them to do. They're living in a way consistent with God's will. Shouldn't that mean a better life? than that of those who are doing the opposite. Much, much less to, to have to, to be punished for it. And so Peter reminds them, where, did, where does he take them? Where, where, where ought we look to be reminded that this obviously is not a promise God has made us? That if we're faithful to his will, that we will not suffer in this life. Jesus, Jesus, himself. Himself. Jesus himself. God's own son who is innocent and, and faithful in a way that we can never be. And yet, he suffered worst of all. And, and so he's, he's holding up Jesus as, as both comfort and as an example. right? That Jesus did this for you. This is who you are because of what Jesus did for you. And now, we, we follow in, 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 in his path. Knowing ultimately what? Where does that path lead? Home. Yeah, home with Jesus. It ends in glory, which is where it ended with Jesus. Uh, so, so that's always that's it's continually being put before uh, Peter's hearers here. So, I've given you a, a, an outline uh, of, of the uh, of the letter, and, and, and it really does hang together quite well. Um, there, there, there's there's hardly you know Paul will sometimes take a detour, let's say. And, you know, that, that thing I, oh, by the way, I want to uh, clarify that thing I said two chapters ago. Let me spend three chapters on that. Okay, now back to the main argument. Uh, Peter pretty much sticks to his, to, to his thesis. Uh, memorable verses. These are just a few. Uh, but it's, it's from here that we get the great uh, catechism uh, explanation of the second article of the Creed. Uh, I believe uh, that, that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from all eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death. Where does Luther get that? First Peter. First Peter. Um, it's here that, that we have the, the, the priesthood of all believers verse. And we talked about that, how that gets abused. We want to understand that aright. That, that, that what, what's, the primary, what, what, what's the primary responsibility of the priest? To intercede. To intercede. To intercede. And see, we take that, or a, a lot of American Protestants take that priesthood of all believers and run with it to, to say, oh, see, I don't need a priest to interpret the Bible for me. I can interpret it myself. And that's so divorced from the original context as to be untrue. The point is the, 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 the church itself, because royal priesthood is what God himself called the Old Testament Israelites. I mean, yes, they also had priests who presided over their meetings, and, and, and their, their, their worship and their sacrifices, but they were all priests 
between whom and whom? If, if we've got an intercession going on, we, we've got we, we've got two parties that that need interceding between. How, how is all of Israel in the Old Testament? How, how were they a, a holy priesthood? They were interceding between whom and whom? God and the Gentiles. God and the world. And so likewise, the Christian church intercedes between God and the world. Which means they don't know it, but we're the only thing the world's got going for. What's one of the ways we intercede for the world? We talk and we lead people to the Lord. We share the gospel, absolutely. But what else? We pray. We, we pray for the world. We pray for our leaders. We pray for unbelievers. They pray be brought to faith. Yeah, that's that's the royal priesthood idea. Uh, uh, honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. That that's a pretty famous verse uh, from from First Peter, uh, and and falls in that section where he's talking about being submission submissive to the to the authorities, the government. Baptism now saves you. In that great section in chapter three, where uh, the the flood is, is held out as this type of this foreshadowing of baptism, uh, which is God's means of, of saving us. Uh, love covers a multitude of sins. Uh, from chapter four, maybe we ought to revisit that just a little bit. What, what, what do we say Peter means by that? Love covers a multitude of sins. You gotta get this one right. And not end up in a, in a heretical place. Overlooks. What's that? Overlooks it. Overlooks it. So, so who's who's doing the loving? Who's doing the sinning? We're sinning. Oh, okay, but but in the context, he's addressing us. He's addressing his hearers. That they ought to do this. When? They ought to show what? Love. 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 In, in what circumstance? In, in, in the context of what? When someone sins against them? Yeah, when someone sins against them or they, they see another's fault. Love covers a multitude of sin. <coughs> so uh, the Christian is called to cover his neighbor's sin. <coughs> as opposed to spreading it on social media. Go, go into Facebook with it immediately. Right? Yeah, love covers a multitude of sins. Not, uh, so, so long as you had loving intent, even if what you did ended up killing the guy, that's okay, it's covered. You, you, you meant that love. No, no, that, that's not what, what that verse means. It's not love covers a multitude in the sense of your, your sincerity or your intentions make up for the fact that what you did Caused a genocide. Uh, no, no. Love, what, this is what love does. It's like 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter in Paul's letter. And, and all the things that love does and love doesn't do. Right? It doesn't, doesn't keep record of wrong. That kind of thing. You know, that, that, that's almost a perfect parallel to this. Love doesn't keep a record of wrong. Love covers a multitude of sins. Same idea. Very similar idea. Is, uh, is that a good verse? Like, I always think of it for a marriage. Yeah. Right? I mean, just because someone oh. didn't empty the dishwasher when I asked them to, doesn't mean I don't love. You know what I right. mean? Right. Right. N not not that you remember that ever happening in Scott. No, right. <laughs> but you've read about that happening in other marriages. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No. Exactly. Because yeah. a marriage can't survive that. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. I'm if so you, sinful, he would just leave me. Right. Right. Just, yeah. Yeah. No. It, Love covers a multitude of sins, right? You, you, you move on. It's like uh, Paul saying in Philippians, right? He, you know, he doesn't look on, on the past, right? He presses on toward the goal, right? Le leaving the other behind. And, and what's interesting there in Philippians is what he's leaving behind is both the good and the bad stuff. In, in, in other words, I, I'm not going to grow complacent and secure in the fact that I walked an old lady across the street three years ago. <laughs> you see? Because he's just gotten finished touting all his credentials as a good Jew. He leaves that behind. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't rest on the fact that 
But not only do I have this great pedigree as a Pharisee of Pharisees, and I have kept all these laws. Nope. It's as if I've done nothing right yet. But I still press on because I live in Christ's righteousness. He doesn't want a righteousness of his own, but a righteousness that is Christ. So we, we should put both all of our good works and our sins in the rearview mirror. And press on toward the goal. And the goal is secure not because of anything performed or not performed yesterday but all because of inheritance that Christ has secured for us and continues to keep secure for us uh, for the future. Okay, and then finally, uh, memorably, the, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, uh, verse from, uh, from chapter 5. Any last questions about 1 Peter? Okay, is that all right? Yeah, that's good. Okay, how about... Because uh, uh, it's always nice to go back and forth between the two testaments. How about for next time, Hosea? Okay, all right. Well, if you don't like it, tough. Is that what we're doing? Have we ever done Hosea before? What's that? If, if I've done Hosea before, I did it as part of a. Um, Wednesday morning. Did we do it on Wednesday? We did Habakkuk. Do we, do we do Hosea? We did. Yes, we did. How yeah. long ago, though? Right, right. Oh, probably quite, quite a while. Okay, well, there you go. It's, it, it's, it's new to us. Yeah. So, okay, good. Because I remember doing a Minor Prophets um, series, and so we, we wouldn't have gone as in-depth then on Hosea. But anyway, okay. Well, that's, I may have notes then. This is, this is, this is good to know. That goes off. I'll do a little... We'll search. Okay, let's close in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the weeks you've given us to uh, read the book of 1 Peter, uh, this word that the Apostle Peter had not only for the churches of his day in Asia Minor, but, but uh, a word that speaks to us even today. May your Holy Spirit strengthen our faith in your Son Jesus that we might have the confidence to go through whatever trial uh, we may have to go through in this life. Uh, whatever suffering we may have to endure, and especially suffering for the sake of bearing Christ's name, uh, with courage and trust, uh, knowing that Christ loves us with an eternal love and will deliver us from all our afflictions and on that day in which we will uh, share in his glory. And until that time, uh, we uh, uh, ask your blessing on all that we say and do, that it may be to your honor and glory, uh, and, and help bring others to share with us in, in the... Uh, joys of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.